Right, thank you very much for um, inviting me here and as always uh, to the two guys at the front for being so very supportive. I'm a big fan of um, Foundation Media because they basically do what we do a lot of the time, which is capacity building and collecting data, but also trying to establish partnerships um, in many countries around the world, not least in Africa. And as a testimony to that, we've partnered Foundation Media as one of the regional calls going out from the Fleming Fund that happened over the summer. And I have to say that working with uh, Foundation Media has been utterly pleasurable in stark contrast to working with um, the coordinators across Asia. Make of that what you will. But um, it's just been really, really good. Uh, secondly is that I'm very grateful that this um, meeting is in English. I think some of us would struggle if it was in French. I certainly would. And it's something we always take for granted. Um, and I don't think we should. So thank you for that. We support the IOI. We like this course so much. We've supported over the few years four or five fellows. And we nominate two fellows to come to this course. And regrettably, the two fellows that we have nominated are not here um, because it's been an utter nightmare, not least with our, our African um, friend, uh, Rashida Khalid, to try and get a visa. And, and today's her birthday. So uh, just to add, rub salt into the wound. So the whole thing's been uh, utterly miserable. And I could lament um, for you for hours on end about this experience, but I won't. I'll save you the agony. Um, but essentially, this is a little bit about what we do. Um, I work in the um, uh, IOI. And the IOI was set up in Oxford about three and a half years ago, the original conversations. And it was to try and do things that others weren't doing. And that's not to sound pompous or arrogant. It's just that the AMR space is a very big space as we've all been talking about, you know. So what what can you do? What can we do that the WHO are not doing? What can we do that the FAO are not doing? What can we do that the London School of Hygiene and uh, sorry, Health and uh, Tropical Medicine are not doing? You know, so what can we actually try and achieve? And so we had three scientific pillars. And the first one was to discover new compounds that we could put into animals that would safeguard human antibiotics from being used in animals. And we've just completed our first in vivo study uh, with close to IND filing with IVDC in, in China. The second is to look at new drugs in humans. And you say to yourself, well, every man and his dog is doing that. What can you possibly achieve that nobody else is achieving? But I'm really pleased to say, and wait for it, we found a compound that we can put with benzyl penicillin, which Ramadan mentioned in his talk, okay, benzyl penicillin, where we put it against the most resistant gram-negative isolates on the planet, and the MICs are less than 0 0.0125. That's quite cool. That gets you out of bed in the morning. Okay, so we're doing okay. And the third one is mainly one I'm going to talk about now a little bit, but also tomorrow evening, um, I'm hoping to share the floor with that guy sitting in front of me, Antoine, who him and I have been friends for a very long time, to um, think about what success means in terms of sustainability, particularly for low-income countries. The UN uh, high-level meeting was already mentioned, but what would be really great is for you to tell us what you would like from people sitting in the room in New York in September next year? What, what would your priorities be? What would you see as success? So I'm just going to have a little bit of a nudge on that. So that's a little bit about who I am. That's a little bit about what I do. So what do we mean by AMR? You know, what, what is AMR? It's incredibly confusing. It's not like COVID. It's not like HIV. It's not one, one you know, uh, bug, disease. Uh, syndrome. And so there are various, it's everywhere, as the previous speakers have all eloquently suggested. So first of all, is that because it's everywhere, it's in the air. And we now know that actually air patterns contribute massively to antimicrobial resistance. You've seen uh, tornadoes in America. And if they can pick up a cow, they can certainly pick up a bacteria. Okay. And so looking at weather patterns, 
and particularly wind patterns, which are very well documented, and looking at the spread from a dirty area to a clean area, etc., etc., is very clean. Do you know one of the things I really think that actually in the UK we're blessed with is because we've got nothing to the west of us apart from water. And so therefore, you know, those bacteria have to come a very long way from Canada or from New York to arrive in our life. But that's not the case with uh, other countries. And there have been some really super elegant studies going on in China at the moment, looking at farming, cross-contaminating human community sectors with respect to wind patterns. Water is obviously a huge issue, and this has been well documented for, for many years. Um, I got into trouble, for those of you who know my background, I got into trouble in India, not least because we discovered NDM1, but then we went into the environment and then we looked at riverlets and waterways and so on and so forth, and we found it there. And so we thought that this might be a public health concern. You know, that wasn't anything new. Previous studies had done something similar. Um, so AMR, more than probably any other kind of health concern, is unquestionably carried by both air and both by water. And then you have insects. I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but we had a study that we published just over a year, getting on for actually two years ago now, uh, that was published in Nature Microbiology, and we showed that actually something like 90% of insects would carry carbapenem-resistant bacteria. And that was in Pakistan. The scary thing was, there's actually, it's hard to believe if you look out the window, but there's 17 million flies on the planet Earth for every human being. Now, I don't know where they get that figures from, but, and I'm not an expert in this, but, you know, if you start doing the maths and start building this up, so is it right, is it wrong? So we've got this rather crazy study going on at the moment involving 90 uh, countries around the world collecting flies within hospitals and comparing that with, late, um, with their AMR data from both clean, clean countries and also not so clean countries. So insects are a, a, a huge vector as well. And so AMR is incredibly complex and we're not actually going to solve it overnight. Uh, and in fact, I don't think we're going to solve the problem at all, quite frankly. You then have the issue of bacteria spreading DNA from one organism to another via plasmids, and I'll come on to that in a minute. But one thing we don't understand is collateral damage. Now, I think Ramna mentioned the fact that actually antibiotics don't necessarily drive antibiotic resistance, depending on what you're looking at. But if you've got a gene cassette, bang, a class 1 integron, and you've got four or five or six antibiotic resistance genes in there, and you're selecting from one of those genes, the five friends come along. And so understanding collateral damage, particularly the way we use antibiotics in farming and uh, in fisheries, etc., is really, really important. Uh, but actually, there's very, very little da uh, information looking at collateral damage. And then, of course, you've got the, the fact that these bacteria are fantastically flexible, plastic, uh, mobile. So they can spread their genes very, very quickly. Uh, as I think the, the, the video actually was rather a nice video, shame we got a bit screwed up, you know, it was showed by Ramanan, the fact that actually this was the fact that you, you had, that was intrinsic resistance, where you have the single bacterium that will adapt and then adapt and adapt again. So, very, very complex. The thing is, is that we sit, AR, a, a, AMR, and we've got to think about this, is actually antibiotic resistance, as opposed to antimicrobial resistance, which includes things like malaria, TB, uh, etc., what you could, I guess, call TB within that, but um, also fungal resistance as well. So this is simply with bacteria. So first of all, we have the antimicrobial resistant genes. And around that, we have a whole series of genetic structures that help the bacteria spread these genes either uh, intracellularly within the bacteria or actually outside of the bacteria. And what we, we didn't really know this until we started looking at these things called IRCRs and ISAs that actually can then form circles and then can conjugate. And we started to work on this about 15 years ago. And we were just kind of amazed that it's not just plasmids that can do this, but other elements as well. Then they can be on the plasmid or the chromosome. And then you have the bacteria that it's sitting and everybody talks about things like compatibility, and I'll come on to that point in a minute, but stability, are these plasmids stable? Looking at things like conjugation, how, how um, broad spectrum are plasmids? 
because we don't know that either. And then whether they actually impose a fitness. And there's, the data on that is, is, is sketchy. And then we come to the so-called tripartite or quadripartite system where we look at animals and humans and environment and the inter interactions between that. And it's just very, very difficult to understand exactly which part is contributing to the problem. So we had this idea um, in Cardiff, actually, because I've only been in Oxford just over three years. And I had a, a supremely gifted, she still is gifted, by the way, a PhD student who is Chinese. And um, Chu uh, was exceptional. And she went back to China to work on this idea. So one of the things that we spoke about kind of without in the, with the previous speakers is the fact of why does resistance spread, and particularly in farming? One thing that we found, particularly in China, on the east coast of China, is that NDM went like wildfire in the farming sector. We didn't understand why. We couldn't get our, our head around it at all. We then followed up with both uh, mice studies and chicken studies and found actually it was uh, the use of ampicillin as basically a growth promoter or disease prevention drug. But that doesn't make any sense. Why would an ampicillin, why would a low-grade penicillin select for NDM, which is a carbapenem resistance? Why didn't it select for OXA or TEM or SHV, but it selected for NDM? Really weird. But nonetheless, why was this so successful? It's associated with a plasmid called INC-X3. And for those of you who don't know in the room, plasmids are typed in a rather weird way, but they're typed. And so we can kind of map plasmid structures to certain types of resistance. So... If you're going to do conjugation, I don't know anybody in this room who's a microbiologist who's done conjugation, it is like this. We basically plate out um, a donor and we plate out a recipient. You can do it on, on agar, you can do it in broth. We turn the lights down low, play a bit of Mozart, and then 24 hours later, we might actually get transconjugation, bacterial sex. Happy days. And this is the diagram on the left slightly pixelated, but this is diagram on the left about, you know, what really happens. But the problem with that is it's so artificial. We've got to go to the lab. We've got to purify a donor, purify a recipient, bung them together, different concentrations, could add antibiotic, may not, whatever. So we thought, that's just wrong. So this is kind of what we did. We decided to try and look at a culturable, independent uh, system. And so basically we labelled the plasmid and we labelled the donor and then we just got that combination, an E. coli, and we just let it loose in hospital waste. And then we added hypochlorite in as well because hypochlorite's often. And so the idea is, is that we put this through a fax machine. It's like an old-fashioned cool, cool to counter. We shine a laser through it and then we separate them out. And so we're able to actually separate out those that where only the plasmid has gone into. Okay, and we did all the controls and everything. So we've now moved away from being culture dependent. What happened? Was it a waste of time? The answer is no. So this is a plasmid, INCX3, that is normally associated with gram-negative bacteria, E. coli, Klebsiella, da 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 And one of the reasons why we did it is because 70-80% of the bacteria on planet Earth we cannot grow in the lab. So therefore, using an unculturable method made a lot of sense. And these are all the bacteria where this plasmid went into, and you'll notice this is the heat map where most of them went into. And guess what? It went into gram-positives. Whoops, it went... I'm sorry, my keyboard's gone weird. So it went into ground positives. So for so long, for the last 30, 40, 50 years, we thought ground positive plasmids go into ground positive, ground negatives go into ground negatives. No, it's just nonsense. And so this kind of blew our, our mind. For the first time, we're actually starting to understand it's actually the complexity of all of this. And this is really important for one health, because all of these bacteria at the top there, we very rarely grow, we're very difficult to grow. But these now oh, sorry, are vectors to the spread of 
multi-drug resistant plasmids in the One Health sector. We also decided to look at hypochlorite, um, which is obviously used in hospital waste, well, uh, in China. And so we increased the concentrations. And the interesting thing is when you start to do that, you obviously start to mitigate the recipient population. And therefore, actually, you are increasing, uh, sort of decreasing the number of conjugation events, and you're also really selecting for particular species that this goes into. So hypochlorite actually does work in terms of hospital waste, in terms of limiting uh, transconjugation. So, great. So the other thing, oops, sorry, wrong slide. The other thing that we did was to look at some of these bacteria. And we found that actually NDM, remember, it's a gram negative plasmid that has NDM5 in, goes into Enterococcus. Why would it go into Enterococcus? But we can then select for it in Enterococcus. It is stable in Enterococcus. And then we took Enterococcus and then mated it back into E. coli. And it worked. And so our understanding hitherto of how resistant works and spreads was just complete and utter nonsense by doing an uncontrollable system. And so we are now moving on from this and we're looking at the effect of plastics. We're also looking at effect of temperature. We're also looking at effect of different soils and acidity. So one of the things we've done across the whole of Africa, for example, we've collected soil samples and we're, collecting them, we're comparing them to China. And in China, we're collecting both East Coast and Tibet uh, in terms of uh, human use and so on. So one of the things we thought was, OK, do plastics actually help conjugation? Now, you can't do this in a culturable system, but you can do it in a non-culturable system. And so essentially, these are the types of plastics. I'm not going to go into any detail here. These are the types of plastics at the bottom here. Uh, these are color co co coded like this. Uh, this is polypropylene, polystyrene, polyethylene, da 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 da. These are the controls. And then when we start to add plastics into the conjugation process, you can see that they go up between 100 and 1,000 fold. So plastic pollution actually increases uh, AMR massively. And we realize now that we're doing all the genetics and we realize that this is associated with uh, particular genes. So the way in which we treat our planet has actually indirect consequences to also the spread of AMR. This slide has been done to death. So I think we've all put this slide up in one form or another. So I'm not going to dwell on it all too much. The only thing I will just say, and I had to write this article, I was forced to write this article because I was just so grumpy about One Health. And I'm still grumpy about One Health because... I actually, in fact, we had a conversation in the UK with uh, Dame Sally Davis's group and ours and a few others, and we've decided that actually One Health AMR is quite unhelpful because, number one, nobody actually understands what it is, including me, and number two is that we think it's sort of a bit of a distraction from actually where the battlefield, you know, really should be. But anyway, we can debate that uh, over lunch or whatever. We're really interested in understanding the things like sustainable development goals because we actually think that AMR should be its own SDG and there's an opportunity uh, for a group of us to, to come together and start looking at petitioning the UN to do that. And the only thing you might actually uh, add is that peace, justice and strong institutions, which is an SDG, um, might actually have nothing to do with AMR. But in fact, it does. So this is... Um, this is uh, photos from Gaza. Um, this here is um, Armenian and uh, um, the Armenian refugees. And this last one here is the refugees that are currently leaving Pakistan and have to go back to Afghanistan. All of these populations are um, well over a million. And everywhere they go, they basically the sanitation is extremely poor. They might end up at UNHCR camps. They may not. Uh, potable water is scarce. They probably have to defecate into a latrine, etc., uh, etc. Et and so this is a, a really massive issue. And so you might actually think that peace, just in, justice or injustice and strong institutions have nothing to do with AMR, but they certainly do. This is a, another example, uh, going back to the whole point of water. 
You know, so this is actually what happened in Pakistan in the Bella Christian area in Sida um, about a year ago, just over a year ago. And this was the immense amount of flooding. Um, something like 25,000 people died, uh, to, uh, nearly 200 million people got displaced. And so it was, you know, a real issue. And when that happens, you get mass contamination of portable water. This has been said by lots of uh, previous speakers um, and so I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but, and we can debate the figures, but I think I'll probably have to agree with Raman and I think at the moment the trajectory looks like it is going up. Uh, and that's because we sort of have a burgeoning uh, middle class across Southeast Asia and China, and they will want uh, meat as a food source. The interesting thing with this, and just going back to this whole point of collateral damage, is that ampicillin was used in China, uh, it still is as a growth promoter and it selects for NDM. Calistin, surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, I should say, select for MCR. And you know the story of MCR and calistin. I'm not going to say anything too much about that. And oxytetracycline, which is really interesting, and chlortetracycline, a pretty rubbish antibiotic, actually selects for ticocycline. And we've got some very strong data coming out of um, uh, Pakistan to support that. Um, this is um, Thomas's von Bockel's group, and again, this slide has been shown, but you can see where the antibiotic consumption is. And the thing is, is that, and I don't know how people feel about this, but it's a bit like climate change. And in the UK, we're very sensitive about how we do our messaging. So you can point the finger at other countries and say to them that you have to do X, Y, and Z, but it's the carrot and the stick approach. You have to actually have a solution or have to be part of the pathway to a solution, be on that journey. Uh, and this is something, you know, I think that we're all thinking about with respect to what may happen at the UN uh, HLM next year. Uh, Ramanan uh, presented this slide as well, so I'm not going to dwell on that too much, only to say that actually, if you kind of have a look, look at the figures from Thomas's group, it looks like all of these are going up or only heading in one direction. And the worrying thing is things like polymyxins, you know, are going up by about 10%, which is um, a bit worrisome. But clearly, uh, as already stated, is that South um, Asia or Asia uh, is the biggest culprit. So very quickly, the means to control it. I think there's two obstacles here. Number one, the bugs. And number two, money. Uh, and also how we spend money. And there is a lot of money out there. Um, does anybody know how much um, Man Pepe uh, earns a week when he plays for Paris Saint-Germain? No, it's about, it's about something like about half a million euros a week, which is kind of not bad, you know. So there's a lot of money out there. Uh, Ineos are about to spend, I don't know, something like about two, maybe not, close to two billion in buying 25% share in Manchester United. Uh, there are just, the world is awash with money. It's just a case of trying to identify that and, and access that and put that to uh, where it's most needed. But the guy sitting down in the front table in front of me will know far more about money than I do and how to resource it. But the bugs, you know, are a real issue as we've already mentioned thing about hygiene is that hygiene is, uh, you know, we all know about the issues of hygiene. This is a, actually a photograph that I took um, very recently when I was in Nigeria. And here you've got a mother showing a little boy that he should wash his hands. And the thing is, is that hand hygiene is something that probably every single hospital knows about. But almost across low-income countries, every single hospital doesn't do for one reason or another. And I'm always amazed. I've just come back from Nigeria last week. And the first thing I do when I go into an NICU is that I'm given socks to put over my shoes. I'm not given a mask. I'm not, given, I'm not told to wash my hands using an alcohol rub. I'm given socks to put over my shoes. You know, and I, it's just a very weird process. You know, and because basically because the road outside is dirty and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so you, there is a bit of logic behind that. But I just think that in the way in which we've kind of gone about this is, is really, really sad. So anyway, on that note, this is just some of the uh, hospitals where we work. This is Ambessa, which is in uh, Addis. 
And the reason why I'm showing you this is because this hospital doesn't have any running water at all. So the water has to be bucketed in from outside by a courier, which, by the way, costs the hospital a lot of money. So why doesn't it work? It's all about maintenance and the pipes, etc. So, you know, they've got a reasonably functional uh, NICU group, which is great. Their equipment is very poor. So things like access and maintenance of equipment for things like neonatal cots and incubators is really, really poor. So who deals with that and who kind of takes care of that? This is Desi. And if you don't know, uh, is anybody in the room from Ethiopia? No, OK. So Desi's in the north and Desi was overtaken by militants and the hospital was ransacked one year ago. So what they've done in terms of a kind of a makeshift uh, unit, NIC unit, has been absolutely fantastic. But Desi also doesn't have any running water. So again, everything has to be bucketed in. In Hawassa, which is to the south, basically, of Addis, which is kind of south, southwest, this was the toilet in the uh, labor ward. And again, no running water, just a bucket for water. And so when we talk about IPC, you can talk about IPC all day, every day, and we can have these targets all day, every day, and we can have these guidelines all day, every day. But unless something actually happens on the ground to actually affect change that is sustainable, um, we may as well just talk to each other in a completely different language. And so, you know, there are real challenges. Uh, this is um, a different country now, this is Sierra Leone, where we work. And again, um, challenging, uh, again, this was labor ward, challenging with respect to uh, the water being brought into the toilet and then you know, having to be flushed. You'll notice here that there's a lovely little well out here um, where the uh, mothers and the babies are getting their water. And that actually is quite clean and that actually works. Um, so that was kind of one of the few bits of good news. So what about other solutions. Well, this is a really good review um, by Anders Carlin, who I really, really rate, and it was written by Kevin Houston, who heads up CarbEx. And I've just given you one figure from this particular paper. So Farges now are starting to become really important considerations, let's just call it that, as antimicrobials. Whether they will be used in humans fully, I don't think they will. Um, but they, they do have their uses. Experiments going on in farms, decontaminating sewage, um, and actually also decontaminating human gut as well. There are now some um, clinical trials going on. Um, probiotics are really important. So what we mean by probiotics is basically replen replenishing the normal flora um, with um, friendly, ba friendly bacteria after the patient's had a, a fairly severe treatment of um, antibiotics. The one thing I'll just say about phages is phages have been around longer than antibiotics. They were discovered in 1914 uh, on the edge of the Ganges. And it was a beautiful experiment, for those of you who don't know, by a guy called Frederick Tort, who saw these lovely little kids playing in the Ganges, and they didn't get sick, didn't get cholera. So he thought maybe there's something in the Ganges water that protects them. So he had this mad idea going back to his lab, getting his team, because they were working on cholera, to drink cholera, and then to drink the Ganges water. Beautiful. Um, breaks every single health and safety, ethics, uh, experiment, whatever, in the world. But within two days, they discovered phages, or at least something in the Ganges water that protected them. And I just think that's a really, really cool thing to do, personally. These days, that would take about five years to get ethical approval. So, you know, phages are really, really good. This is how they, they, how they act. They basically get into the bacterial genome. They replicate, and then you get bacterial lysis. The problem, and you can see here, I just grabbed this off the um, PubMed. You can see the number of publications now going into phages, uh, particularly with um, medical application. So it's a, it's a growing area. Will it come to something? I'm not entirely sure. But these, again, are there some of the areas that are, it's being applied to. And I actually think that they're useful. And the one thing I, too, will just add to this is that we're also looking at phages on the flies as well. 
to see if flies can be vectors for phages to decontaminate uh, the environment. So a slightly wacky idea, but this is something that we've got going on. So this is, um, I'm going to quickly fast track this. Uh, vaccines have been spoken about, it's very heavily pixelated. The vaccines have been spoken about quite um, avidly, and particularly with Raman, and I do agree with Raman, I think vaccines are uh, a really uh, powerful way to curb uh, antimicrobial resistance. The father of vaccines was the, really this guy here. Um, does anybody know who he is? Well done, Edward Jenner. So um, Edward Jenner was, uh, basically he did this experiment in about 1791, um, published his work in about 1795, this is the village which he comes from. Uh, that is where he did this experiment. This is where I live. And I didn't buy the house deliberately. I just want you to know that, to be next to him. But it turned out that way. And this is the castle which is uh, next door to both of us. And there's just a very quick anecdotal funny story about this. I adopted a little girl from China. Um, many years ago, about 15 years ago, more than 15 years ago. And we had to send an aerial shot of the village because the Chinese wanted to know that she would be taken care of. So I sent, a, I sent through this photograph because it's the only one I could find. And the people in Beijing thought I lived in Barclay Castle. So they got very excited at the fact that one of their daughters was going to be brought up in... But anyway, uh, but the thing is, is that actually... Smallpox became the most successful vaccine ever, our greatest defeat over any infectious disease, and the WHO were absolutely fantastic in identifying hot spots where the vaccine could be implemented. But it was, it's interesting that actually we, as a global community, a hundred years ago, got on very, very well in, in fighting smallpox. But in fact, um, you know, you saw what happened in COVID where we had the so-called COVID walls and we were fighting over resources and vaccines and so on and so forth. And I'm not entirely sure we've uh, actually progressed. Going back to the sustainable development goals, um, this is really important to us to understand what sustainability looks like. For those of you who don't know, and this is just an aid memoir uh, as to what the declaration looked like, uh, in 2016, you can go through it, and it's a basically a commitment to take AMR seriously, particularly national action plans, and has already been mentioned um, that some countries have done very well and some haven't. So the question is, what will 2024 look like and how we move forward uh, into 2024? So this is a guy who really um, deserves a lot of credit. His name's Jim O'Neill. He wrote a whole series of articles building up to the UN meeting in 2016. I met him for lunch in London um, for about a two-hour meeting because he's a super busy person about four weeks ago. And he's fed up, really sick and tired of how far we've got from 2016. To quote him, we led people up to the top of the hill and then we walked away. You know, somehow we abandoned the process. You could blame Brexit, you can blame COVID, you can blame whatever you want to blame. But actually, we actually, in, since the last eight years, we actually haven't achieved an awful lot. So, uh, but I think we've now persuaded him to become a, a little bit more active. Um, this is my penultimate slide. This is half my team um, that I have. This is ha actually half the team in Program C, the kind of the clinical stuff. This is the neonatal sepsis work. And you can see that we are from all over uh, the place. And that's just how we like it. And this is just a thank you for your attention uh, in the various languages in the countries where we work. And just to say that tomorrow evening, I'm gonna, we're going to try and follow up with a far more interactive session and ask you what you would like to see in terms of a UN meeting and how that might serve you. So thank you.